co-founder of two parent and teen empowerment organizations, Real Teen Talk and Inner Star Girl. Lisa consults and speaks with parents and teens on academic, social, and emotional issues and helps guide families and children with the transition to middle school, high school, and college. Alicia Pedowitz, California Director at Moving Traditions, has made her career working with teens using the richness of Jewish community, ritual, tradition, and wisdom to help them thrive. Alicia has worked as an educator and communal professional at Jewish camps, schools, and agencies throughout California. Alicia is also an AJU alum and holds an MBA in nonprofit management, a master's degree in education, and a bachelor's degree in Hebrew letters. She also has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Stanford. Welcome today, Lisa and Alicia, and thank you for joining us. There's so much happening in our world right now and so much uncertainty with our children. They ask many questions, they're struggling, they're unsure of what, what, what is happening and what awaits for them. And this is particularly true of teenagers, right? Who seem to be in a category of their own. So um, that's the real, the focus of our talk today, right? Teenagers like to socially distance from their parents. It's what they do is they transition from childhood to adulthood. And here we are not socially distanced with them in our homes, um, you know, in some cases 24 seven, and that can be a lot. So I've invited you both here today to share your words of wisdom in reflection of what is happening in this time when our teams with our teens and helping them and helping us help them um, navigate what's happening in our world. Um, Alicia, I understand you'll be using some Jewish wisdom to help us navigate with our teens through the time of COVID. So please do share with us. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it is such a pleasure to be uh, joining you. As you said, the AJU is my, my alma mater from graduate school. And, um, and hello to everyone who's joining us for this conversation. And I, I just want to repeat something that actually uh, I had said to Michelle and to Lisa when we first first started speaking, which is full transparency. I am not a, a parenting expert. Um, I am a mom of a 10 and a 12 year old. And so like everyone on this call who has kids trying to figure out how I support them through this in the same way all of you are. Um, but I do happen to be a Jewish educator and um, with I guess I will say a specialty in teens. I, I have long loved working with teenagers and I feel very lucky to be working for an organization right now, Moving Traditions, um, who fundamentally is about um, supporting teenagers, Jewish teenagers, um, preteens and their parents to navigate the unknowns of adolescence, um, to find the joys and the challenges as they do so. And um, our whole philosophy is to bring the most current research and healthy adolescent development, social emotional learning theory and Jewish wisdom and ritual together to help support teens in this. And I think that the thing that is helpful for us to think about right now is where we can draw some wisdom is what we are doing is health, what we are in the midst of is one giant unknown. None of us have faced anything like this in our lifetimes and it can feel really daunting to be figuring out how we then support our teenagers, our children through this. But if we take a step back, we can remember that we are, we do have some wisdom for helping young people navigate unknowns. That is what we do as parents. Um, and that is where we have some wisdom from, from, from uh, Jewish texts as well as these other places. And so that's what I wanted to share a little bit about. Um, some of the things that we've been doing at Moving Traditions, a couple of helpful ways of contextualizing that idea. Um, and just in, by way of Jewish wisdom, I'll start from um, a, a piece of text that comes from the Talmud, Kiddushin 29a, that talks about our obligations as parents, what we are obligated to teach our children. And there are kind of three things that are mentioned. We're supposed to teach our children Torah, we're supposed to teach them how to make a living and we're supposed to teach them how to swim. And it's that last one that I think is helpful for us right now. It, it's the one that seems the most kind of bizarre and out there like, what does that mean? We have to teach them how to swim. Um, and, and if you look at it both literally and figuratively, 
It's about giving our children um, what they need to survive, right? We, a, a kid falls into a swimming pool, we wanna make sure they have the, the means to not sink, but to swim. Um, and when our kids go out into the massive unknown waters of the world, we wanna make sure we've given them the emotional skills to be able to navigate that for themselves. Um, and that's really a lot of what we are also doing during adolescence, giving them those emotional skills because they're navigating unknowns all the time in middle school and high school and into the world beyond. And we want them to be able to do that without us right there, um, but to draw from inward. And so there's a couple of things from that that um, at Moving Traditions we've been speaking about over the last two months of this pandemic. And one has to do with resiliency. Um, you know, how uh, that's a really important skill that I think we are all thinking about as parents, um, particularly for our teenagers who are developmentally at this moment in time where they're supposed to be growing their independence. And part of that independence is the ability to bounce back in the face of challenges. And what does it take to do that? And while they might be doing that in their bedrooms, um, we still want them to be able to, to rise up and feel like they can continue to pick themselves up even as all of this is daunting and scary. And um, one of the things actually a few weeks ago for Passover, one of the ways we encouraged families to talk with their preteens and teens around the Seder table is is this idea of resiliency. Um, we looked at research that came out of the Family Narratives Lab at Emory University, a really cool laboratory that looks at how families tell their stories of who they are as a family and how that impacts their children based on what those stories are. And one of the things that they have found is that youth who know family stories of triumph over hardship so either from their immediate family or from their family's past, these times where they've, they've heard that their family has triumphed in the face of great hardship, those youth demonstrate higher levels of, um, of well-being, of emotional resiliency, kind of social emotional indicators across the board are elevated because of that. And Passover, right, is this perfect moment um, where literally what we are doing is retelling the story of our people's resiliency, of our people's ability to triumph uh, in the face of the massive, of massive hardship, right, of coming out of slavery um, to the promised land. And so we, I'm going to share my screen for a moment to share something with all of you. Um, that, sorry, this is where the technological fun of <laughs> navigating this on screen um, happens. So here we go. Share my screen. And I want to make that bigger, don't I? Yes, I do. There you go. Um, so we actually have encouraged parents to use that moment, but actually any moment sitting around your table um, to give your, your teens um, or your preteens the gift of stories of triumphing over hardship in your family. Um, and we'll send, I'm happy to send some resources via Michelle after this to, to anyone who was on this webinar, but this is on our website. Um, and it's this idea that I can take this time to tell you some stories of who our family is and to be thinking about like, yes, this is hard and this is scary, but um, we are a family that will, that will continue to be okay. Um, and uh, the last thing I just wanted to say, and we can come back to it when we're doing Q&A, is one other thing that we're thinking about is meaningful connection. How do you meaningfully connect when you're never apart, especially with teenagers who, again, developmentally are at this phase where they're supposed to be kind of like getting some distance and independence, and yet suddenly we're all on top of each other, but we want to make sure we're meaningfully connecting. <laughs> And this idea of helping kid, kids to swim, like I talked about before, is also being able to have really like loving, secure um, relationships to fall back on that keep them bolstered. Um, and so we've done a little bit around this idea. And one of the things that we've been talking about is the idea of love languages. Um, uh, psychologist Gary Chapman um, has created this whole idea that there are different languages that people communicate how they love um, with one another and actually Michelle should I how am I doing on time should I get into this a little more or um no I think I think you you have another minute or two you're good Perfect. okay awesome 
Um, again, I'll send some more resources from our website, but really thinking about um, encouraging families to, I'm going to share my screen one more time, to think about um, what are what are the ways, the pe actually I won't share my screen, what are the ways the people in your family at home um, both communicate I, that I love you and want to hear I love you. And for some people that's that's through physical touch. He talks about different ways that people want to experience love and share love, the acts of uh, physical acts of affection, sharing quality time, doing acts of service, like noticing, hey, the dishes are, need to be washed and you're busy, so I'm gonna wash them. That's how some people show love and want to have love shown to them. Um, words of affirmation, there are people who just wanna hear like really meaningful words of, I notice you, I appreciate you, I love you, and gifts thoughtful gifts, no matter what those gifts are, something that shows I was thinking about you. So thinking about how you and the, the young people in your home communicate love and want to hear love can give you ways of, of really kind of maximizing meaningful connection time, even as you're on top of each other. So thank you, Alicia. I love that you helped frame this within Jewish wisdom and helping us navigate this through that Jewish lens. A lot of what we do as Jews is very communal, right? We always like to come together. The, the more the merrier, the more there's food, the more there are people, the more there are people gathering, the better we are as a community. So this is, I really love the concept about thinking about love and communicating that to help our kids navigate through this time with some resiliency and forming those meaningful connections. Um, to our audience, this is a program of Bayaha Together, spirited by AJU. We are speaking with Alicia Pedowitz, the California Director of Moving Traditions and School Counselor Lisa Tiano on ways to guide our teens through these times. You have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Please feel free to submit your questions. We'll be able to begin answering them and going through them as we continue moving forward. Lisa, thank you for joining us today. Thank Please you so do share with us your, your helpful tips to parents. I know you have a little bit more of a clinical perspective and um, a school counselor perspective in terms of what we're seeing with our teens. I know you are an expert primarily in dealing with teen girls but if you could also address, you know, what our boys are feeling and what some of our non-binary teenagers may be dealing with during this time, that would be wonderful. Of course, of course. Thank you so much. And Alicia, I really appreciate your uh, perspective through the Jewish lens and it parallels to a lot of what I would like to talk about today. So my background is definitely a clinical background and counseling background but also um, parent, uh, parent education and teen education and facilitating groups for, tween and, for tweens and teens, although my niche is teen girls. But I think I really would like all of us to acknowledge the obvious, which there's a lot of serious first times. You know, Michelle and Alicia and I were talking in discussion this week, and we have to acknowledge that this is a, this is a first pandemic in a century. These are serious first times, um, first time in quarantine and social distancing and virtual learning and homeschooling and celebrating milestone events like senior graduations and proms. Um, all these things that have been lost and taken away has caused so much grief and anxiety and stress. And I think this quarantine in looking at it from a family systems approach because I'm all about that approach. Um, it's either bringing more families together, closer together, or it's creating more conflict. And I think if there's one takeaway that I would like to give parents today is that we need to really focus on parenting well and not parenting perfectly. And Michelle and I are in the trenches of raising two teenagers. You have the boys, Michelle, I have yep. the girls. Um, of course, very different dynamics between boys and girls, um, emotionally and socially. Um, but, you know, I have the 16 year old and the 19 year old and um, it's hard. This is hard. This is really hard in dealing with, with the reality. And I think 
the first, there's a, a few tips that I would like to share with everyone that I would like to share my screen just so, so I can share with everyone, um, keeping a sense of perspective, but I'm gonna just do this and I can share with everyone. Okay. Okay, so the first thing is really keeping a sense of perspective. We're obviously not parents with superpowers. We can't possibly be everything to everybody. And I've been using this philosophy, the keep in simple philosophy for years. I took it from my dad. He was the most positive person. And despite any challenge or obstacle, he would always say, keep it simple. Um, and of course, it's hard to do that when you're practicing and when you're a parent or an educator, it doesn't matter, it's really difficult. But I think the first thing is we have to practice acceptance, knowing that we can't change or have any control over things that we can control. You know, this is a crisis, this is a national crisis and we're in the trenches of it. And so we have to really model for our kids model for our preteens and teens. Um, it's okay to be bored. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be disappointed. So many parents are struggling right now and I'm getting quite a few phone calls and emails and parents are questioning their own parenting. Um, even with years of experience in raising um, younger kids, older kids, suddenly they're feeling and questioning themselves. Why do I feel like such a bad parent? Um, my, my thing is, if you're questioning yourself as a parent, then you most likely are a good parent. I think it's the parents who don't have any involvement in their children's lives or very little involvement. Those are the parents that I worry about um, that aren't, that aren't, uh, keyed into the, the non-verbal signs, the things that we really need to look for with our kids. Lisa, we have a question um, from the audience along those yes. same lines. Yes. Parenting while divorced and how non-custodial parents are finding difficulties connecting with teenagers, right? So, you know, they don't want anything to do with us in general because they're teenagers and now they may have, um, a custodial versus non-custodial parent or two different homes or a blended family. And these present additional challenges. How do we help our parents navigate teenagers living in multiple homes with all the stay-at-home orders still in place? Can you help address that a bit? Absolutely, such a good question. Um, I also uh, have some personal experience in terms of being a child who was um, who had divorced parents, and it affected me tremendously. Um, and I do talk to parents about that who are going through the same experiences. I think the the key is to not make the child um, the scapegoat, and also putting the child in the middle of that spouse dynamic. Okay, so there's the relationship and then in the dynamics between um, the parents, but then there's also the other dynamic between the child, the teen, and each individual parent. Um, and it's really hard because a lot of uh, a lot of preteens and teens who talk with me do share with me that they are being pulled in different directions. That's when I have to. Um, use, utilize the resources and I collaborate with a lot of therapists and psychologists in the community and that's when um, it's beyond the scope of my experience and I really think that they do need um, a mental health professional to, to help out with those situations. But I think the key is breaking the code, breaking the code of unhealthy communication because if the child is receiving different messages from the mom um, and the dad, then that, co that cohesiveness, that synergy in the family is, um, is, is, is broken, it's ruined. You have no, 
no synergy, no balance. And now that we're in quarantine, it makes it worse because you have possibly the child who feels more comfortable being with dad versus being with mom. Right. So we have to be really careful with those, with those dynamics. Thank you, Lisa. I know in, in my home, we sometimes joke that, or I joke <laughs> that I made two children, one for you and one for me. And I'm not gonna name which one's mine and which one's yours because it often switches, right? And so um, we have one, one of our, one member of our audience asking about how um, their child speaks freely with one partner, but not with them. And, um, you know, I, I, we see that in our own home. I'm sure that's really commonplace in everyone's home with teenagers. And in our home, it sometimes it switches. It switches around from child to child in terms of who they will connect with, which parent they will connect with. Are there any suggestions um, for connecting parents in that way with their teens during this time? If I, oh, I, I oh. stop sharing my screen, so we're back, right? Alicia, feel free to hop in there and, you know, if there's a Jewish perspective on that as well. Well, it's, even, it's I welcome. mean, I just, both to this question and, and the last question, um, I have a little bit of personal experience, but I think some of the things that um, I was talking about earlier can also be helpful. Um, I, I, I share custody with my, with my kid's dad and they've been going back and forth between our two homes. Um, and so that other question is one I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and also um, my my 12 year old son who is very much like a, a pre-teen, like I, <laughs> his, his kind of like beginning adolescence has really spanned the last few months with all of this, um, doesn't love to talk. Um, and I've been really trying to think about that, that, that second question that was posed of like, how do I like make sure I'm meaningfully connecting with him right now? Like he doesn't seem to be interested. The questions I ask, the, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard enough time trying to figure out how to do all of this. And I would actually say, um, you know, um, at least in something like cracking the code and, and similarly what I was mentioning before the, the, some of the stuff that we've shared at Movie Traditions around love languages, right, is really just about understanding what is meaningful for your particular kid. And, um, and you, they may not want to have long conversations with you. I mean, um, for a while, I was thinking, oh, gosh, like my son, I'm trying to find out how he's doing. I want to talk to him about these things. He used to open up. He isn't. You know, and then I just kind of realized us actually taking a walk together in the evenings, even if we're not necessarily talking about stuff is meaningful time. It's time that he is in some way connecting with me. Um, I've realized he actually, like, he's totally a, uh, a video game playing kid. And up until the moment of this pandemic, I have seen that as something that is like, that is, okay, like, that's the thing that he does, but like, that's not what I want him to be really spending his time on. And I'm going to share time with him on other things that are more meaningful and kind of realizing like right now, all right, like this is what we got, right? So um, he's shared with me some, some game apps that he uses to play games over text with his friends during the day. And I was like, great, like, all right, let's add me and let's play a game, even though that's not something I would normally be doing <laughs> with him or see his quality like connecting time, I'm realizing this is how he's connecting right now. Um, and whatever I can do to just find those things that actually like you know, and back to the keep it simple, like, you know, I'm probably not doing my best parenting right now, but it is very simple. It's the things that like the easy ways that I'm finding that he can remember that I'm there with him either virtually or when he's at his dad's or right here with me. Um, and it provides openings to other things. So I've just been thinking about like, what is he kind of doing and, and what language to speak to him in, even if it's not, you know, doesn't feel to me like the deepest possible connection but it's reminding him that I'm there with him, Lisa. So these are all, you know, periods of transition, right? Our, our teenagers are transitioning, our preteens, our young adults from childhood into adulthood. There's this constant, you know, struggle for independence and pushing boundaries. We have a question from one of our viewers who really like to hear about um, high school juniors, which is interesting. I have a high school junior in the house um, this person, you know, we're, we're all dealing with 
again, unknowns. They're navigating college applications, getting ready to leave the nest, but they're trying to establish their independence. You know, junior year is especially um, busy with tests and SAT, ATT, college prep, college tours. How do we help them navigate that? How do we, what tools do we infuse them with as parents when they're really trying to create that break off step from us? Um, maybe Lisa, you can help, you can help here since you have that experience, especially yeah. from the school, the school counselor perspective. Of course. Um, and I also wanted to add something that's really helped to me. Um, and I have also um, made this suggestion to, to other families and it's really been helpful. Um, I think it's really helpful to, in keeping the connection um, and respectful communication because every one of us are on different pages right now. We're trying to be good at our jobs. We're trying to have our kids um, be successful at working remotely. There's all these new things, but the, the family meetings, the weekly family meetings and the, and the emotional and social check-ins have been so helpful because these are very unpredictable times and also with unpredictable emotions. So if any one of us is feeling differently in our parenting lately, which I've been hearing from a lot of families um, and moms and dads, um, and they're questioning themselves, but in wanting to help your kids, you can't, you can't do that unless you have taken on self-care. So this is, a, this is a huge piece of um, everything that we're talking about, because I see it as like a puzzle and there's all these little pieces, but you can't put the puzzle together if right, one or two pieces is missing. And it could be a really crucial piece that you're missing. The crucial piece to the puzzle that I talk to families about is that um, it's that confidence that you have in yourself as a parent and also the way you're reacting to your kids. So because we are undergoing such chaos right now and there's such conflict in the world, we wanna make sure that we have that foundation at home. How do we do that? It's not easy. But I think, um, as I'm going to use a quote from Brene Brown, if you don't show up in the arena, then um, then you can't you can't do what you're supposed to do and have that courage and be vulnerable. And I think our kids really need to see that piece. They need to see that we don't know how to do this perfectly. We don't know how to give you the answers. So for my older daughter who's asking me questions when will she return back to college? And, you know, she wants to be with her friends and sorority and all these things that have been taken away, right, from all these other kids too. We don't have all the answers. And my response is always, I don't have the answer, but I think empathy has no script. And that's also a piece of this big puzzle that we're living in right now, because it's, there's so much unknowns out there. And parents are constantly asking, how do I do this? And what do I say to my younger child and my older child? And I'm being pulled in this direction. And families are losing uh, their jobs. I have you know, parents who are losing their homes. They can't pay their bills. So how do you do that and be a parent and have your own individuality as well and be vulnerable all at the same time? And I think that's where the empathy comes in. So listening more to our kids, you know, and I think we need to listen more. I need to, I think as parents, we need to withhold the judgment and then going back um, to parents who are divorced, that's a really hard piece because there is a lot of judgment and there are a lot of questions and kids just don't want to be, um, Put in the middle of all that while they're un while they're going through this uh, chaos themselves. They want us to hold everything together, but you know what? We can't we can't always be that perfect parent at home. And if I'm having a hard day and I find myself I'm snapping a little bit more, I don't you know if, if I'm snapping at my husband more, if I'm snapping at my kids, I have to take a deep breath. Sometimes I will communicate. I'll say out loud, I need a break. And 
that's breaking the code right there. We, we don't have to have all these rules and parents will also ask me, but what about social media? And my son's on his phone all day long and he's on his bed in the same position. And I'm like, rules are rules and rules are great and structure is necessary in raising kids. But right now we have to um, shift a little bit. We have to really be able to shift and be flexible. And that's a really important piece of this big puzzle too. If we're not shifting the perspective and looking at beyond ourselves and our jobs as a parent, there's a lot of working moms too. Um, we have to learn how to do that. And it's, and it's not easy and it's okay to say to our kids, I don't know how to do this, but you know what? We're going to do it together and we're going to figure this out. But setting intentions, not for next week or the week after that, setting really clear intentions, realistic intentions for today and tomorrow or the next few days. Thank you, Lisa. I think that's, that's really well said. I think it's important for us to remember as parents not to beat ourselves up, right? There's no guidebook for navigating what our world is going through right now. And and remembering to be flexible, right? Being a little rubber band that can, I remember that first day of school of kindergarten, the teacher hands out a toolkit and includes a rubber band, which reminds us that flexibility in this time is really helpful for each of us as parents as we navigate the pressures of home, work, life, and children, and the heightened emotions of teenagers in the house. Um, to the audience, just a reminder, you are here with us at Biyaha Together, a program spirited by AJU. Today, we are speaking with Alicia Pedowitz, California Director of Moving Traditions, and Lisa Tiano. Please, your questions are coming in fast and furious. We welcome them. Please continue putting them in the Q&A. We appreciate you being here with us today. Um, Alicia, our kids... From a Jewish perspective, can you help address the notion of grief and mourning? Because I hear that, and I do believe that our kids are going through a grief period right now. They're mourning loss. Um, you know, there's so much ritual that is gone from their lives, especially as we wrap up the school year, graduations, culminations, those trans transitions from preschool to elementary school, elementary to middle, middle to high school, high school to college, high school, college graduations themselves, that closure is gone and it kind of leaves us, uh, you know, lacking and hurt. And we as parents lived perhaps through graduations, we knew what they were. I know myself as a parent, my son's high school graduation was, uh, you know, was about me more than it was about him at times because it was just this nice closure, everything that we'd worked for together as a family to bring him to this point. Can you help us address that a little bit from a, a Jewish lens, a Jewish perspective on grief and mourning and loss at this time? Absolutely. Um, I was actually thinking a bit about that even from, I know there was the earlier question about high school juniors and, you know, kind of the realities of in some ways what is lost for them right now as they're thinking about what comes next and how you do that and thinking about the seniors who are graduating or the kids who are transitioning to middle school um, and all of the different ways that those moments of adolescence are usually marked um, and aren't. Not to mention the loss of um, many people actually are experiencing real, like you no know, people who have passed away during all of this. Um, but in terms of kind of the loss of those moments, and I think that Judaism has a really beautiful way to me of looking at that, which is that um, throughout all of our tradition, throughout all of our ritual, um, we are very good at acknowledging two seemingly different emotional experiences or competing truths at once. Um, we often acknowledge loss at the same time that we also hold space for joy um, and vice versa. And I think that when you think about what is ritual, right, these traditions that we've talked about, what a graduation looks like, um, that they've been anticipating. I'm thinking about my 12-year-old my is graduating elementary school and his graduation isn't gonna happen and he's starting middle school in the midst of this. I'm very aware of like what the loss is to him. Um, 
And I think as parents, we are thinking about all kinds of those losses for our kids. Um, and what I think the wisdom of our tradition gives us around that is A, we, should, we can absolutely acknowledge that loss, um, speak about that loss, recognize that, that it is a sense of loss, things that they were expecting, um, and at the same time, still making sure that we find ways to mark the joy that is happening in that, right? Ritual, the you know, rituals or traditions or ceremonies are about holding space and creating containers for, you know, the emotions around these, these, these big moments and transitions. Um, and whatever those traditions are, the way we usually celebrate something, it, it's a tradition, but it's about what's actually happening, the joy that is happening. So I think that it's important that we make sure that we are acknowledging and saying to our kids, I, I've said the, the word, yeah, this sucks so many times, you know, um, like it is painful, like it is hard to think about this thing that you were looking forward to that I was looking forward to with you for all of the years to come to this moment and it not be happening in the way that you expected. Um, we, need, we can acknowledge that and then also make sure that we are still finding ways to mark and give space for the joy around whatever that is. So the kids who are graduating in the midst of this loss of what their graduation ceremonies would have looked like, should have looked like, are not going to look like, and also making sure we give room for the joy, whatever this is going to look like, whatever we are able to do to mark that joy of like, and you have, you know, worked toward this moment, and that is something to joyously celebrate. Um, and I think that right now, our days are filled with so many, like a roller coaster between those extremes. Um, and we got to acknowledge all of them, but also make sure that we are giving our kids the space, even if they're kind of like, I don't want it because it's not what I thought it was going to be. We need to help make sure that we are finding ways to mark the, the sure. good things that are still happening for them in the midst of it. Sure. Thank you, Alicia, for that wonderful perspective. We have several questions coming in along the same lines of, you know, kids who are isolating themselves. They're in their rooms all day. They don't want to come out. They don't want to be involved in any family oriented activities. Uh, maybe they're not even reaching out to their friends. You know, they're so active normally on social media and texting and Snapchatting and doing all these other things. And now they find the, uh, we have several questions coming in where parents are finding their kids kind of closing in on themselves. So Lisa, can you help address what this is all about? you know, about spending time alone and being alone? Is it something we should be concerned with as parents or is this part of the normal um, cycle of transition as a teenager or part of just the unknown and spending time safer at home? And you know what, Michelle, there's no right or wrong answer. I think the thing that should be concerning is when you have no communication with your teenager. Um, you can imagine, and going back to what uh, Alicia and I were saying earlier, all these celebratory events that have been taken from them, um, and, there's, and it has all, you know, come to a halt so abruptly. I think we have to remember and understand and reflect back to when we were teenagers, you know, wanting our privacy and wanting our space. Um, whether that means having the door closed or, or what have you. Um, I, think, I think it's really important to be mindful of that. Let, parent, let us as parents, and I have to remind myself too, um, I'll share something with all of you. Um, just a few days ago, my older daughter came to me. She wasn't riled up. She looked pretty serious and I was like, what's up? And she said, um, she's like, mom, you know, I, I, I've been home now during all this and I feel like I'm being pulled in so many directions and, um, and she loves her sister, don't get me wrong. They definitely have those moments where they want to spend together, but then it's almost like, get away from me. I want my own time. I want, you know, I want to be in my own room. But she said to me that she um, doesn't appreciate when we just, you know, walk in there and there are times where she just, she's busy or she's doing whatever. And she really wants us to be knocking on the door. And I had to 
stop myself and own that, you know, I, I take accountability. Here I am teaching children and teens, right? To take accountability for your actions and your behaviors um, and our emotions. And that's, that's on me as a parent. So of course, I, the first thing I did was apologize. And, and I said to her, you're absolutely 100% right. And we had a family meeting about it. It wasn't like a whole formal, you know, sit, when I say family meeting, I don't mean, okay, everybody, it's six o'clock, let's sit down and have this <laughs> board meeting. I mean, let's have the, the check-ins with each other and, um, and talk to each other very respectfully. There has to be the respectful communication. I mean, that's, the, that's one of the main things at the top of my list as, as a parent, whatever is going on in the house, um, whatever chaos, we each need to communicate very respectfully. Um, and in terms of uh, you know, respecting the personal space, I just think that we have to um, we have to also model that too for our kids. And I say that out loud now. If I'm if I if I need my own space, I will say out loud. I will say out loud, "Hey guys," even to my husband, my girls. You know, I'm going to be in my room, and I'm going to just I'm going to take a half hour. I need some things I need to do. So we need to respect our kids, right at the tween and teen age. We need to respect that what they're going through now. If they're spending hours on end in their room you have to do that emotional check-in at some point. Um, and I wouldn't wait till the following week. Every week there should be communication going on. And also what are they doing on social media? Um, it's the parents are concerned about the hours they're expressing to me, you know, my son, my daughter has been on social media for hours on end and this is insane and this is crazy. I would be more concerned about what they're doing on social media. Um, smart social, if no one has heard about smart social with Josh Oaks, um, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful resource. I always refer parents to smart social and there's free webinars and a lot of social media education, what parents need to know with apps, but with teenagers, of course, it's hard. Are you checking their phones? Probably not. Okay. But I would be more, again, not to be redundant, but versus the time and the hours, what are they doing on, on their phones? Thank you, Lisa. That is, you know, the, there are quite a few questions in the chat about screen times and time spent gaming on social media, kids finding that that's all they really have to do right now. And I could see the questions coming in. Parents, as parents, we're concerned that that screen time is unhealthy. How, how do we help our teens find joy right now, right? You know, the teenagers, you know, when the kids are younger, it's a lot easier to entertain them. A little bike ride, a scooter ride, a, a trip to, you know, the fish pond at the local strip mall. Teenagers need big giant amusement parks. They need their friends. They need venues. They need bigger more abundant kinds of things than younger children. How do we help them tap into joy in different spaces and in different ways? Do either of you have any, any ideas, any tips and tricks for our audience? It, this is gonna sound again, keeping it simple, right? Here we go. You ask your child, you have that conversation. What are some things that you wanna do? What would make you happy? I know you're going through some really tough times right now. So you're going back to validating the place that he or she is in, that we are in as parents, we're all going through this together, but we as the parent may say, hey, how about a bike ride? Let's go for some yogurt. And, or, and, but that may have no, um, that, that may be at the bottom of your child's list. So. Sure. Your bike ride, may, he, he or she may be totally interested in the things that you think will bring your children joy. I think we have to be really mindful too that what brings us joy may not necessarily bring our kids joy. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for that. As we get close to the end of our time here, the questions keep coming in and I thank the community for, for asking so many 
so many thoughtful and well-connected questions. If anything, I learned here today that um, we as parents should not feel guilty for what we're doing. We are all doing our best as we navigate this together. Any um, resources, tips for navigating the summer, Alicia and Lisa, that you would like to share with us as we wrap up today? Tips for navigating the summer? Oh, wow. <laughs> I think we're all, we're all. Resources out there. I know we're all in the same boat. You know, uh, school, school is coming to an end, right? So that yeah. kind of fulfills a lot of their day in terms of that loose structure. If they were in Zoom meetings or responding to school activity, yeah. school events. But now um, that's coming to an end. And we have camps that may not be happening, vacations that are vacation plans that are going away, you know, any, any, any tips and tricks for navigating what may be coming ahead the next few months? I have a, I have a great resource. It's also on one of my slides and we, of course, um, you can share the slides with, with everyone, but um, there's a wonderful site called thejournal.com. So I've, I'm finding that kids and adults are all experiencing doing new things. Like I'm not a baker and I found myself suddenly baking a cheesecake <laughs> like over the, during this whole quarantine. And um, it could be baking, it could be coding, it could be photography or drawing or knitting, taking up something new that perhaps you didn't do before. And I know kids love camp. I certainly know, you know, our kids, Michelle with, um, yeah. with working at camp has been I don't know what's going to happen with that, but that was her summer um, being a camp counselor for eight years, or is it going on eight, seven or eight? So what do you do again when all of that has been taken away? Finding new joy, new joy is discovering things and new skills that you never even knew that existed, or maybe you, it's been on your, like something to check off on your bucket list and you haven't gotten a chance to do it, hey, this is the opportune time. And so here I am thinking, okay, we're in the midst of this chaos, but look at all these new things that we have opportunities for taking advantage of and, and adults, us as well. Um, I never did yoga before until recently. And my younger one was like, hey, mom, come outside. And she's a dancer, but of course, they have yoga videos and whatnot. She's like, hey, mom, want to do yoga? And I'm thinking, okay, hopefully I can cross my legs and bend my toes and have someone not say, can, can you pick me up? Um, and that was hilarious. But you know what? We laughed a little bit. And it was mm -hmm. like, we, that was a little, a little bit of joy. And we, we experienced it together. Whether she liked being with me or not, she invited me. So I thought, hey, I'm going to take this opportunity. Sure, but sure. I think for kids in the summer, and going back to your question, Michelle, there's so many things that, that kids can take advantage of and, or that they wanted to do or have been wanting to do for a while. This is, this is the time. This is the opportune time. Take it. Thank Go you. Can I, well, can I just add I'm something really? Oh. As, I'm sorry, Alicia. I just wanted to add quickly something to what Lisa yes, just please. said which is, um, you know, one of the things that we are finding in, in um, the teen education, the Jewish teen education space that we're hearing across the board um, has to do with right now, um, everyone is recognizing, doubling down on the importance of connection over content and anything that happens. And so as camps are ca canceling, you know, in person and, and different programs that our kids are usually involved in um, are not happening, um, everyone is recognizing what's most important is finding ways to keep them connected with one another, even if it's only for an hour here or an hour there. Um, and we've spent a lot of time in this conversation talking about connections with us. I know that that was the premise of the of this conversation with with us as parents at home, but it's also really important, like all of the work that we do at Moving Traditions also points to the importance of teens having time to connect um, with other teens and without us around them. So how do we find, like there are ways to be doing that at home right now. And sometimes we need to push them a little bit more. I'm, again, I'm having that, that same trouble. Like, you know, kids are sort of like 
drawing in, but there are a lot of wonderful resources out there to get to just make sure teens are having connections with each other still, because that's a critical point part of adolescence. Um, this is actually Mental Health Awareness Month, and um, there's an amazing collaborative effort going on by many Jewish teen organizations um, called Collective Compassion. Um, we're offering some um, programs next week for teenagers to connect with one another, and other organizations are as well. So I'll send that over to you, Michelle, but to be also thinking about that. Um, as important for our kids as their summers are going to look very different than normal. Sure. Well, as we wrap up today, I have, uh, Alicia, I have one more thing. I have my virtual teen groups on Saturdays that I totally forgot to mention. Oh, please, so please. Talking about keeping the connection with, uh, and it's with teen girls, ages 12 to 16, and it's very exciting, and it's happening um, 11 to 12 every um, every weekend. So. The let's get social team groups. Excellent. Well, Alicia and Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your words of wisdom with us today and helping us navigate this time as parents and parents of teenagers. I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. This has been a program of Beyaha Together, spirited by American Jewish University. I invite you to visit our website to learn more about our offerings at aju.edu slash beyachad together. We hope you will join us for future programming. Tomorrow we welcome author of Unfiltered, How to Be As Happy As You Look on Social Media, and Hala Baker, Jessica Abo, in conversation with Rabbi Sherry Hirsch, as they will be making challah together. On Monday, we're hosting a conversation with Senior Rabbi and Director of Spiritual Care at Cedar sinai Medical Center, Jason Weiner, titled, Is Risking My Safety for the Greater Good Really Good? Information on how to register and how to join us at no cost, again, can be found on aju.edu slash biyaka together. We look forward to seeing you online and wish you a good evening. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.